Let's take our Bibles this morning, open them to Romans chapter 3, verse 9. In stereo, I'm liking it. It's good. Um, Romans chapter 3, verse 9 is where we'll start in just a few minutes. If you were to visit Bryson City, North Carolina, they have a, a very unusual tourist attraction. It's kind of, uh, kind of an oddity. Bryson City is in the eastern foothills of the Smoky Mountains. And in Bryson City, North Carolina, they have a road to nowhere. That's literally what it's called. Back in the 1940s, the Tennessee Valley Authority, a branch of the federal government, built a hydroelectric dam just west of Bryson City. They had to relocate some cemeteries and a couple of small villages. And so they promised the people who were there when they built that dam and flooded the area, creating a lake, that they would build a road so that they could have access to those cemeteries and so they could go back to the place where they had lived and where their families were from. But after a few years, the money ran out and the federal government began to spend on something else and they never completed the road. After seven miles of Lakeview Drive that goes west from Bryson City, North Carolina, there is a tunnel in the side of the mountain. And once you go through the tunnel, you come to an abrupt stop because all you see in front of you where the road ends are the woods of the Smoky Mountain National Park. It is literally a road to nowhere. You can't get anywhere from there. In so many ways, most people in this world are on a road to nowhere. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said that broad is the road, that wide is the gate, that leads to destruction, and many travel on that road. That's what Jesus said. And then he said, narrow is the road, and and narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few find it. Few. Jesus said there are many that find that, that road to destruction. You don't have to do anything. You're just on it. But few find the road to life. What Jesus called that is being lost. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said that his personal mission was to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, here's what you need to understand. That while many of you have heard that for most of your life, and many of you have heard that terminology forever, many of us don't believe that deep in our hearts. Deep in our hearts, we believe that somehow God's gonna shoehorn everybody into heaven, that somehow God will make sure that everybody gets to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says, and that's not what Jesus said. And so today, we're going to talk about the lost highway. We're going to summarize these last few sections of the book of Romans and, and talk about what Paul has to say to us about people being lost. In the first three chapters of the book of Romans, Paul has pulled all of the supports out from under each one of us. For whatever we think we could do to be righteous, for whatever we think we could do to measure up to God's standard, Paul has just ripped that support out from under us to help us understand there is nothing, that we are helpless and we are hopeless apart from Jesus. And he does that in such a way that is really interesting. First of all, he addresses the pagan world. In Romans chapter 1, he talked to people who had no regard, no regard for God or morality. And we saw what he said about them, that, that God gave them over to a depraved mind. Then he talks about the religious people. He says, so you think you're better than them. In Romans chapter 2, we talked about this last week, how that our religion will not make us right with God. And then he finally addresses another group of people that were kind of self-righteous. These were Jewish people who said, you know what, it really doesn't matter what we do. We're children of Abraham. Our heritage is, is that we're children of Abraham and we'll go to heaven no matter what. It's sort of like people who say, you know what, my, my family's been Baptist all our lives. I mean, I'll go to heaven when I die. It doesn't matter how I live. Maybe it does. Yes, it does. And so Paul begins to sort of unpack all of this. And in Romans chapter three, verse nine, he comes to a summary of the first three and a half chapters of Romans, the two and a half chapters of Romans. And so what I'm going to deal with this morning is the summary of it so that we just kind of grab it, grab onto it, 
um, for what Paul is trying to teach us and so we understand it. Look at Romans chapter 3 verse 9. What then? In other words, after all these words that I've written, what does this all come down to? Let's boil it all down. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips. The whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. And in the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So here's what Paul does. For the first two and a half chapters, Paul essentially, it's like a fireworks show. You know, you go to a fireworks show and they send off one of those big giant fireworks and it explodes in the sky. That's what Paul does in chapter one. Boom. The pagan world is lost. Then he shoots off another fireworks. Boom. The, the religious world is lost without Jesus. And then the, finally, boom, the self-righteous, those who think that their heredity, that, that their, where they grew up or who their parents are is going to get them into heaven. That, that firework goes off. And then in this section of Scripture, it's like the grand finale. You've been to a fireworks show, you know, you see the boom, boom, boom. And then at the end, like they shoot off all these fireworks all at the same time, just boom, 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 boom. That's what Paul does in this passage. There are 14 different quotations from Psalms and Isaiah that Paul just uses in rapid succession, just one right after another, to show us the reason we are lost. Here's the reason that, we, that people are lost. He says there are three. First of all, we are lost because of our character, who we are. A person is lost because of their character, who a person is. In verse 10, Paul says, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands, none who seeks God. They've all turned aside. Together they become useless. There is none who does good. Four times, none, 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 none. Paul just says it over and over. And what he's doing is, it's like those fireworks are just exploding so that he emphasizes and we get this picture that none of us are good. None of us are. Now, look, that's not a popular sentiment. That's not a popular opinion. As a matter of fact, the whole world says that you can be good. Uh, Luke Bryan, I happen to like some of his music. Luke Bryan sang a song a couple of years ago. Most people are good. Now, that song rose out of the 2016 election cycle when, you know, politics became really personal. And, and if, you don't, if you don't agree with me, then you're just a terrible person. Uh, not, not just we disagree on politics. You're a horrible individual. You're deplorable. And so he said, look, you know, look to the other side. There's some goodness in those people, too. And I kind of get the sentiment behind that. But Luke's wrong. Paul would say most people are not good. Paul says no people are good. None of us are good. We are not good in the sense of this. When Paul uses the word good, he's talking about moral righteousness, meeting God's perfect standard. In order to be good, you have to be perfect. So how many of us fit that bill? The answer is none of us. That's why he says it four times. None of us are righteous. None of us seek God. None of us understand. None of us are good. So our character deep within us is fatally flawed. Now look, when God made people in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were good. They were. But that doesn't last long. They sin, and then they lost the essence of that goodness. They're no longer morally perfect. They're not good. Now here's what's interesting. When you receive Jesus and you receive the Holy Spirit, one of the nine fruit of the Spirit is goodness. You can be made good, 
but you're not good on your own. So character, who we are. Second, conversation, what a person says. Listen to what he says in verse 13. Their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He's talking about sins of the tongue. Now, why would Paul bring sins of the tongue up specifically? Well, sins of the tongue are overt sins. They're out in the open. For example, you could steal something and nobody would ever know. That's kind of covert. You could commit adultery and nobody would ever know. You could fornicate and maybe nobody ever knows. But when you commit a sin with your tongue, then that's public. That's, that's out there. Everybody sees it or everybody hears it. And Paul says that our tongues keep deceiving. In other words, our lies are evident. He talks about slander, that our mouth is full of, of uh, that the poison of asp rather, rather is under their list. An asp is a snake. It's a very venomous snake. And he says it's like there is venom in our words. Some of you in this room have been subjected to the poisonous words of other people about you. You have, you have suffered from what that verse describes. The poison of asps, the, like poisonous snakes being under their lips. What they've said about you wasn't true, it wasn't kind, it was meant to destroy your reputation, your character. And Paul says, it's our conversation. And then he says this, he says that whose mouth is full of cursing. You know, there are studies that say that the use of profanity has skyrocketed in our culture. That all you have to do is look around and listen to the number of F-bombs that are dropped, to the number of times that people take God's name in vain, both in, the, in music and in media. It is constantly surrounding us, and it proves the fallenness of our lives. Jesus said, Jesus said, that out of the abundance of the heart or out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That what you say is actually evidence of what's in your heart. And so that's why Paul brings up our conversation, what we say. And finally, our conduct, what a person does. Verses 15 to 18. He says, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their path, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Just leave that verse up there for just a minute. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I think you could write that verse over a generation. We no longer fear God. We take God lightly. We take his word lightly. We take the truth that God both is love, yes, he is, but he is also righteous, and he is holy, and he is a God of wrath that punishes sin. We don't take that seriously anymore in our generation. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Evidence of that? There's a, an animated show. Animated shows are primarily to speak to children, right? Called Little Demon. I don't know which one of the apps it's on, but it's, it's on one of those apps, and Little Demon is the story of how Satan impregnated a human woman and the child then is the Antichrist, according to the storyline. In the first eight minutes of the first episode, there were 12 profanity-laced mocking statements of God, of the Bible, and of Christians. This is not entertainment. This is indoctrination. That's what it is. And it's for you to take God lightly because what you laugh at, you never take seriously again. And the whole strategy of this is for God to be mocked and so that people will not fear him. The Bible talks a lot about the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. That's what the Bible says. That to fear God is to find the path to life. That's what the book of Proverbs says. That when you take away the fear of God, there is a sense in which all is lost. Those are the reasons that people are lost. But what about the wrong directions when people are lost? Paul, Paul kind of brings this to a summary statement now down in verse 19 and 20. 
And Paul's going to bring this whole, this whole first couple of chapters and two and a half chapters to a pivot point in the book. And here's his pivot point. He says in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be accountable to God. Here's what you need to know. That the whole world is accountable individually for God. The whole world is accountable individually for God. I, I want to really make that clear because I want you to understand that. Sometimes people quote a verse. It's a little deeper in the, in the chapter, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 which says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, many of you have heard that over and over and over. And some people quote that and it's like they take comfort in it. It's like saying, we're all in the same boat. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. Yes, we are. And it's the Titanic. It's sinking. It's on the way to destruction. And Paul says that we are all going to stand before God individually. Your pastor's not going to be there. Your mama's not going to be there. Your daddy's not going to be there. Your brother and sister's not going to be there. Your best friend's not going to be there. Your girlfriend's not going to be there. Your boyfriend's not going to be there. Your husband, your wife's not going to be there. Nobody's going to be there. You're going to stand before God. And there are some of you who seem to think that you're a pretty slick talker and you've talked your way out of trouble before and you're going to talk your way out of this one. And Paul writes these words that every mouth may be closed. That's a kind way to interpret that. It's a kind way to translate that. The, the essence of it is this. Parents in the room, you'll get this. Future parents, someday this will happen to you. You know your child's done something wrong and you confront them about it. And they have a thousand excuses. But dad, you don't understand this happened. And, 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 and you know, I had to do this. And you know, it really wasn't my fault. It was, it was my brother's fault or my sister's fault. And, and, and you know, I was with this group of people and I just couldn't do this. And finally, you say, zip it. Stop. And your child then knows you actually mean business and you're serious. God is really serious. He's really serious. God is serious about sin. And Paul wants us to understand this, that we are all going to be accountable to him. And we are going to be accountable individually, personally. But he also wants you to understand this. And, and this is Paul's really kind of the point that he wanted to get to. That works will never make us right with God. The whole first three chapters of this deal is to come to this point to say, look, nothing you can do will save or rescue you from your sin. Paul says religious works won't make you right with God. In the first century when Paul was writing this, it was Jews who thought if I go to the temple, if I make a sacrifice, if, if I burn the incense, if I say the right prayer, then I'll be right with God. And our generation be baptized in every church in town. It won't make you right with God. Take the Lord's Supper in every church in town. Have perfect attendance. Show up for life group worship and on Wednesday nights. I'm really glad you do that. But it won't make you right with God. Religious works won't make you right with God but kind works won't make you right with God. There's a thought in our culture that when I stand before God, he's going to look and see, what was I kind to the poor? What was I generous? Did I, did I help people? Did I, did I engage in, in acts of compassion and kindness? As if those would outweigh our sin. Kind works will not make you right with God. And finally, moral works will not make you right with God. Being a good person, trying to obey the Ten Commandments. Every now and then somebody will come to me. It's usually a guy. And they'll say something like this. I'm going to get right with God. I'm going to get right with God. And what he usually means by that is I'm going to quit drinking too much. I'm going to quit fooling around and cheating on my spouse. I'm going to stop cussing. I'm, I'm going to stop all these things. Like my moral goodness is going to increase and therefore I'll be right with God. It doesn't work that way. Moral works will not make us right with God. Whether you are absolutely one of the worst people that's ever lived, 
and I don't think that's anybody in the room, or you're the best person that ever lived. I mean, you're like, you're like you excel morally. We are all under the sentence of judgment for our sin. Uh, let me put it this way. Let's say we all took a trip and we went out to California for a visit not to live. And we go to Huntington Beach Pier. And I say, let's have a contest. We're going to swim from Huntington. We're going to jump off Huntington Beach Pier where the water's probably 50, 100 feet deep. And we're going to swim to Hawaii, 2,600 miles. The first one there wins. Well, some of you jump off the pier and you're not a swimmer. You don't swim. So you just sink and you're dead. Some of you can swim a little. Maybe you can swim a half a mile. But eventually you sink. You drown. You're dead. I swim as a means of working out, as exercise. Maybe I could make it a couple of miles. Maybe I could make it three miles. Maybe I could make it five miles. But eventually, I run out. I sink, and I'm dead. There are people who swim 10Ks. That's 6.2 miles. That's impressive. I, can't do, I couldn't do that. But eventually, they run out. Diana Nyad swam from Havana, Cuba to Key West, Florida, 90 miles but she almost drowned in the last 500 meters. She simply could not move anymore. Let's say she could go 100 miles before she dies and drowns. No matter if you jump off the pier and you drown, or you swim two miles and you drown, or 100 miles and you, dr and you drown, you're just as dead. No matter if you are the worst moral person on the planet, or you're the best moral person on the planet, you still fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short. None of us make it to God's standard of righteousness. And that's what Paul wants us to hear. You say, well, Bob, but that doesn't sound like good news. It's not. It's the bad news, which makes the good news necessary, which makes the good news so good best news ever that even though we are helpless and hopeless to save ourselves even though there's no fear of God before our eyes even though we are not righteous and we turn from God and we go our own way even though that we do what is right in our own eyes and we twist the commandments of God to try to say that it's right God sent Jesus to die a death I deserved to give me a life I could only imagine. That's the good news. The good news is that God sent Jesus to make a way, one way, the only way to spend an eternity with God in heaven, to be made right with God. Now, there is a second issue with this that I think begs to be talked about. For those of us who by God's grace, we have been saved. It is grace and grace alone that comes into our life through faith alone. It's not by works. Those of us who have received that have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to those who are on the wrong road, the broad road, the road that leads to destruction. You have a responsibility, high school students, junior high students, you have a responsibility to the people at your school who are not on the right road. College students, you have a responsibility to those in your college classroom who are not on the right road. If you work in an office or in a business, you have a responsibility to those who don't know Jesus to help them get on the right road. Anita Hughes is 48 years old, and she admits she lives with a lot of fear. As a matter of fact, about the only time she leaves her house is to go to church on Sundays. She works from her home. She has her groceries delivered. You know, Amazon and all those sort of things have allowed her to, uh, to buy things online. But Anita really wanted to go to this gospel music festival in North Carolina. And so she finally worked up the courage and she said, you know what, I'm going to go. And so she packed a bag and she got in her car and she took a deep breath and she drove down the road, got on I-77 and headed south. Went all the way to North Carolina, went to the gospel music festival. 
And she had an incredible time. God just spoke to her. God blessed her while she was there. It was fantastic. And then Anita had to drive home. As she was driving home, she got off to get gas at an exit. And, you know, sometimes at an exit, you could just kind of get turned around. And Anita took the wrong road, maybe the wrong exit. And she wound up on this highway that looked familiar. It was you know, two-lane divided highway like an interstate, but then it narrowed down to just a two-lane highway. And she's driving along, and she realizes, I wasn't on a road like this on the way down here, and, and I, know I'm, I'm, I know something's wrong here. And the fear began to well up. She began to panic. She, and she, the next little town she came to was Strasburg, Virginia. There was a convenience store, and Anita pulled into that convenience store. And she burst through the doors and almost in tears with a loud voice, she said, can anybody help me get home? There was a guy named Jason Wright. Jason's 25 years old. He was in there and he said, well, ma'am, where's home? And she told him. And he said, yes, ma'am, you just, just go back out here on the road and go back, you know, the way you came. And eventually you'll come to I-77 and you, you can go back that way and and she, she was just so full of panic. He could see it in her face. She, she just, she said, is there any way you could, you could take me there? Jason was actually headed the other direction. But he agreed to drop his plans. And he said, follow me. And he drove her 35 miles back to the interstate and got her on the right road. She told her story to a, news, to a station in Cleveland. It made national news. CBS News picked it up. They interviewed both of them, and Jason began to speak. Now, Anita is a black lady, and Jason is a white guy. And so what he said was, look, whether it doesn't matter what color our skin is or what race we're from, we really have a responsibility to help one another get home. Yes, we do. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're like, what does this have to do with me? We really have a responsibility to help one another get home. There's somebody in your life that needs you to say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus has changed my life. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what Jesus has done. There's somebody in your life that needs the hope that only you can bring. They're not going to listen to Bob McCartney. They're going to show up for church. But they'll hear a friend. They'll hear a family member. They'll hear a classmate. So let's help them get home. Father, we come before you this morning grateful that your word is true. And Lord, while this passage has been hard, Thank you for showing us again that without Jesus, we are helpless and we are hopeless. I pray today for anyone in this room who's never trusted Christ, that today would be the day in which they trust him, give their life to him. Lord, but for all of us, would you put some person in our minds right now that we need to talk to, that we need to invite to church, that we need to, that we need to speak to about the gospel, would you put one person on our hearts today that we could help find the way to you? In Jesus' name, amen.